Welcome back to Everard Junction. Today's video is all focused on track weathering and adding lots of detail and scenic bits and bobs to the sidings at the back of the layout. In the last video I finished all of the ballasting in this area, so now it's time to create all of the dirt and muck that you can see in front of you and add a little bit of green stuff, a few bushes, a few bits of grass and things like that to create some sort of overgrown and disused effects. There's also lots of small details and scenic accessories all over the place which will become apparent as the video progresses. So let's go back in time a couple of weeks where this was looking bland and uh, I'll take you through the various steps to produce all of the weathering and various details. So I'm going to get started on some track weathering. This makes a big visual change to the way the layout looks, a little bit like ballasting when you've got bare baseboard and you go to ballast like you see in front of you, it makes a big difference. Track weathering does the same thing and it's important to just be mindful when you're doing it that uh, it can be easily uh, overdone. You don't want to get too much paint in certain areas unless you're going for specific effects. So uh, we'll see how we go. Got a lot of tracks here to weather. To prepare, I've moved all of the rolling stock out of the way. I'll also be using a small amount of masking tape to just mask up some of the details that I've glued down, such as those relay boxes in the background and the back side of the retaining wall just at the bottom of the camera. Once I've neared the end of the weathering process, I'll remove the masking tape and we can just do a very light dusting on those items to blend them in, but I'm conscious that I don't want to get them too covered in paint. The paint itself is from Railmatch and today I'll be using enamel paints. I'll be using two colours, Railmatch Sleeper Grime, which is a nice sort of dark brown, very good for track weathering, and I'll also be using some Roof Dirt, which is a dark grey, and that can be used to accent some uh, areas of oil spillage in the centre of the tracks. I may also switch to a jet black in a couple of places, especially around point work. Something else you'll also need is a track rubber. This is an old Pico one that I've had for a few years. This is to remove the dried paint from the surface of the rails after all the paint has uh, cured and you're happy with all the effects. Obviously you need to remove the paint from the surface of the rails so that the trains will work again. And also if you look at railways in real life, the tops of the rail is always shiny and clean because it constantly has traffic running over it. Something else to be aware of with your track weathering is points. So a lot of points in the hobby, certainly ones we're used to in the UK, rely on an electrical connection between these two rails to actually work properly. When you throw the point from one direction to the other, the electricity passes through the rails and that's how your trains run reliably over the points without stalling. So if I was to just airbrush this whole thing, then we're going to get paint in this key area and that's going to stop the flow of electricity it's going to cause the trains to cut out as they go across the point so before painting make sure you mask up this small area on both sides so that these bits of the rail stay nice and clean if you get paint on them you're going to have to spend a couple of minutes cleaning it up making sure you get all of that paint out of there to make sure the trains run reliably on my layout i don't use those points the insole frog or the electro frog. I'm using the Pico bullhead points and these use the new Unifrog system and that's where the point is pre-wired from the factory to work more reliably than how they have been up till now. So I quite happily paint all over these and I don't suffer any consequences as a result of that. They still have the wire underneath, so you can wire up the frog to a polarity switch, which would be very useful if you've got particularly short wheelbase locomotives, like an 040 or an 060. But certainly for me, using bogeyed diesels, it's not a problem. So I quite happily paint all over these points and the pre-wiring from the factory is more than enough to keep things going. So you won't see me doing any masking or protection of the points, I'll just spray paint all over them but please make sure that you check what points you have before you go and cover them in paint, only to discover that they don't work properly afterwards. I've masked up anything I don't want to get too much overspray on. I'll also put some paper over the back scene, even though it's only temporary, I don't want to get any overspray on that back scene. So we're pretty much ready to paint. But as I say, if you are using the more traditional style of points from Pico or Hornby, and you're relying on that electrical connection between the switch blades, just make sure you mask that up before you start painting, otherwise you'll have quite a lot of cleaning and maintenance to do afterwards. I've got the airbrush set to about 20 psi, nice and gentle, we don't need to fire huge amounts of paint all over the place. 
and I've also got one of these little uh, airbrush filter cups. I've been using one of these now for about six to eight months and I really recommend it. It's made by AK, it only costs a few pounds. I'm really impressed with it. Enamel paint, especially when it's been sitting on your shelf for a while, has a tendency to uh, start to dry out inside and you can sometimes get little bits and bobs stuck in it and it always clogs your airbrush up. When you pour the paint in, if you use one of these, doesn't give you that problem anymore and you get a lovely consistent nice spray out of the brush every time. So we're going to go straight in with the sleeper grime. I've already thinned this out. I use the VMS thinners. quite like this stuff. Both the acrylic and the enamel seem to be pretty good. So I thin this to about, uh, I don't know, something like 60% paint, 40% thinner. I might thin it a little more if it's a bit too thick, but uh, generally once I've used a little bit of these enamel paints and there's a bit of space in the tin, I just pour some thinner in there and it makes them easier to mix the next time round. There you can see some of the nasty bits that were in that tin of paint. That will obviously clog up my airbrush and cause problems. And as I'm about to uh, spray a large area of track, really want to make sure that the airbrush doesn't spit and sputter as you're going around. So I'd highly recommend one of those filter cups, very useful. And then when you finish painting, just clean it out with some enamel thinners and that's ready to go again. I'm going to start at the back and work my way forwards towards the front of the layout. It's just a little bit easier that way. And uh, I'm wearing some gloves. I've also got a mask up here as well. I'll be varying the tones all around the layout. Most of the weathering back here with the point work and these old sidings is gonna be relatively intense. Quite a lot of the sleeper grime color just to give that sort of look of age and disuse. And then once that's thoroughly dried, I can come back over it. We can start to add uh, some foliage and some grasses and things growing up between those stones. On the main and relief lines over here, it's gonna be a little bit cleaner. I'm gonna try and do different effects for each pair of lines and also the branch line will be its own variation in weathering as well. All just go hand in hand to sort of make a varied appearance all around the layout. Track weathering can vary a huge amount even in the same area. So don't be worried to experiment and try different things. And you can also start off with a light weathering, go really nice and gentle. And then later on you can come back and increase its intensity once you get a little bit more confident in what you're doing. So I'm just in the process of letting that dry. That's all of the sleeper grime applied. You can see we've got some different tones. The branch line is quite dirty. These two lines here are relatively clean. These two are a little bit more dirty. We've got the nice contrast of the different ballasts there. And then the sidings back here are absolutely filthy. I'm gonna start blending into the ground cover a little bit around this area. And to do that, I'm gonna hold the airbrush quite far away from where I'm working and that will give us a really nice even gentle spread of dirt into the edge of the ballast and tie all the details in. If you spray it down here you're going to end up painting all kinds of horrible lines and things all over the place. But We just want to tone that down a little bit and show some of the dirt coming off of the uh, trains and falling onto the uh, ground around here. I've applied a general dusting 
of the paint all over the hard standing areas and that's really improved the look of that it's got rid of that sort of very light gray that it was previously just darkened it down a little bit so the next thing to do is to switch over to the roof dirt which is a very very dark gray and i'm going to focus a lot of that over on the old sidings over in the background particularly the points and most of that will be applied between the rails in the center of each track. I will also add a little bit around on the main lines, especially near the station area where low cars are going to be stopped for long periods of times and they're, they're going to leak oil and leak fuel and leak coolant all over the ballast. But uh, yeah, we'll just uh, apply that, but we'll try not to get too carried away. So that completes the airbrushing. You can see the roof dirt, dark grey colour, just adds a little bit of uh, more sort of convincing look, a bit more realism uh, to the middle of the tracks, you know, looking like grease and oil and things like that. So we've got lots of different tones and colours going on now. We've got the branch line looking quite dirty, old and sort of, you know, worn out, which it would be because it's the old bullhead style track. Then we've got these two lines here, relatively clean. You can still see the uh, sort of beige colour to the concrete sleepers. These two tracks are a little bit uh, more sort of dirty looking, again just to make them look a bit more interesting so they're not exactly the same. And then the sidings at the back are really quite filthy and oily and disgusting. I've also focused quite a lot of dirt around the point work in the sidings and I've faded it out where it joins onto the main lines again. This section here is basically a catch point, it's to stop trains from accidentally running out onto the main lines having something parked in there or running into there would actually be very rare. So what I've deliberately done there is given it quite a light weathering as you know, you're not gonna get that sort of brake dust and oil and grease type thing going on. So you can see the route the trains usually take through the point here is really filthy, but then this route here is a lot cleaner and uh, I won't even clean the tops of the rails there, we'll give it a bit more of a rusty appearance. Over at this end, we've got a similar thing going on and I've done my best to blend the new track work back into the old. Once the tops of the rails are cleaned, the look of the whole thing will change again. But uh, hopefully you can see the effect there. So I left all that for a good few hours to dry and I've just gone over all of the track with the track rubber to remove the excess paint from the surface of the rails and you can see how that changes the appearance of the track. So uh, over the course of the rest of the video, I'll touch in any little bits that I'm not quite happy with. But generally speaking, over the whole area, I'm quite happy with the level of weathering we've managed to achieve. So the next thing to do is to start looking at adding some short grass, some shrubs and some weeds, things like that. I've looked at a lot of pictures of areas similar to what you see in front of you uh, back in the 80s to see what they sort of looks like. And you get a real variation of stuff. Some, some stuff can actually be very, very clean, tidy looking, and other stuff looks like it's about ready for being ripped up and scrapped. So I'm trying to sort of strike down the middle. We'll have a little bit of disuse over in the sidings with the sort of grasses and stuff like that. And over on the hard standing, perhaps a, a little bit of very short grass down here wouldn't go amiss. Nice patchy finish, not the whole thing. And similar thing over here. And I think some sort of small shrubs and bushes in certain spots would uh, certainly make the area look a little bit more interesting and uh, a little bit less pristine. And then once I've done that, we'll start looking at adding some details, scrap and bits of waste and stuff in the section of hard standing between the main lines and the sidings. So to get things started, I'm going to be using some of the two millimeter static grass, quite short stuff. And this is the late summer blend by Model Scene. One of my favorite colors, and this is what I tend to use most of on the layout, although I do tend to mix it in with other colors, but the main base is always the late summer grass. I'll complement that with some of the Woodland Scenics coarse turf, burnt grass, again, another one of my favorite colors, nice texture, good for showing weeds and things. And then I've got some of the finer scatters in the form of the earth, 
and the blended turf and these again show small weeds and tufts of sort of moss and stuff like that. I'm going to start things off with the fine turfs. We'll be sprinkling that in the cess here and some of the hard standing over here, also a little bit in the sidings, but we're keeping away from the, the main sort of running lines. Basically anywhere that's sheltered that will allow something to grow and we'll scatter a little bit down here. So there you can see it's a very small scattering of the fine turf. I've used the two different colours, the earth and the earth blend. Very easy to overdo this step, so less is more. Try not to uh, get too carried away, and you can always come back and add more in future if you want to. I've got various pictures on hand here that I can't show you for copyright reasons, but basically they're of the uh, Great Western Main Line around the sort of Oxford and Didcot area where there's sidings alongside the main lines. And I'm trying to sort of portray what the uh, sort of ground cover looked like during the sort of August uh, time of the year. Over here I've added quite a bit more of it to create that sort of disused sort of appearance. As I say, this is a catch point. Locomotives normally wouldn't run into that area unless there was a runaway locomotive so the rails are going to be rusty and there's going to be plenty of plant life growing in that undisturbed area. And a similar story over in the sidings you can see that's looking a little bit more overgrown. This uh, turf should really complement the static grass. To glue it down I've just filled this uh, spray bottle up with a very diluted mix of PVA glue and water, about 30% glue, 70% water, with a splash of dishwashing detergent in there as well. And we're just going to very carefully spray around all the areas that I've applied the turf to, and that'll dry nicely overnight. So I've sprayed all of the scatter with the watered down glue mix and I've just wiped down any of the details. It's a lovely warm evening so that should dry quite quickly. It's a very weak mixture of glue but as we're only gluing together you know, tiny pieces of uh, scatter material that will hold it just fine. So I'll leave that overnight. We'll come back in the morning, check it's fully cured, give all of this a vacuum, get rid of any of the excess materials and then we can move on to the static grass. It's very tempting to do the static grass now, but the problem you'll get is obviously all of this is now wet and your static grass will adhere to all sorts of places and it will it'll look like a, a football pitch. So it's important that when you do the static grass, everything is fully cured, nice and dry, and then it only goes where you put the spots of glue. And when you vacuum off the excess, you get a nice patchy finish. That glue mix is now dried and all of this scatter is now firmly fixed to the scenery. I vacuumed off any excess material and now it's time to apply some of the static grass. I'm going to be starting things off with the 2mm static grass and I'm going to be applying that in various areas all around the sidings and in between the tracks and over towards the branch line by the retaining wall. I'm going to try to not go too crazy with it, try and keep it relatively subtle and I'll be using pictures as I've said previously for reference. To apply it, I've got some ordinary cheap white glue from DIY store and I've just watered that down very slightly with a little bit of water. So it's still quite thick, but uh, it's not full strength PVA. I'm going to use a series of brushes to apply spots of glue around the areas that I want to apply the grass. Then apply the grass and remove the excess with the vacuum once that glue has dried. And that should get us a nice varied patchy tone in all the areas I want some of the grass to be, rather than being a sort of generic uh, sort of football pitch appearance. 
You of course need a static grass applicator to apply static grass. This is a homemade one, I made this about 10 years ago. It still works, so I just stick with it. But uh, there are various uh, commercial uh, static grass applicators available and uh, most of them are actually quite good. So that's all of the static grass applied. Obviously there's a huge amount of excess material there, so it looks very overgrown. Once this has dried in a few hours, I'll come back, vacuum off the excess material and save it for a future project. And then we can uh, look at applying a few more different effects and start thinking about some extra little bits of scenic detail. The glue is now dried and I've just vacuumed off the excess grass and saved it for later. You can see there it's quite a subtle effect, but once you start looking, the grass really starts to show. There you can see all the grass I've managed to save. I just took the bag out of the vacuum cleaner, made sure it was clean inside, and you can see there's loads in there, almost an entire bag of static grass. Static grass lasts forever if you sort of do that method, make sure you save it after you've finished doing a scenic project. I haven't bought any static grass for nearly three years now. That's the main bulk of the grass now applied. What I'll do next is I'm going to add a couple of small tufts of taller grass in certain places and I'll also change the colours as well. So we'll go for more of a straw colour and perhaps some sort of lighter green colours to represent sort of new and old plant growth. Just to give a bit of variation to this otherwise very generic colour that I've applied so far. I'll be applying this in just patches in certain areas. What I've done up until this point is done the patchy approach, but I've done it over the entire area. Now we're just going to focus on specific spots rather than the whole thing, and it will just make things look a little bit more varied. At the moment that's uh, a nice patchy finish, but it's rather uniform all the way around the curve. I'd like some areas that look a little bit different. So if we take this small shed as an example, I'd put some just in this area here, it's sheltered from the building, you're going to get taller grasses growing there. Also at both ends of the sidings in this sort of uh, catch point head shunt area, very little traffic in this section of the railway. So as you can see, the grass is more intense around here already, but I will add a couple of spots of that taller grass because it's not going to uh, be uh, harmed by any trains because nothing really goes here. So I'm going to go up a size in grass, we're going to go to the 4.5mm static grass. Again this is model scene, the same stuff I've used already. And we're going to use a base of the late summer, which is exactly the same colour that I've just used. That will be the base, and then in that mix I will add the early summer or the beige, depending on the effect I'm going for. So the base colour will remain the same, but we'll just have slight accents of green or slight accents of the sort of beige, sort of dead grass.
So that's the glue for that now dried and I've removed the excess grass once again and hopefully there you can see the slightly different colour, the slightly greener appearance of the grass and it's in slightly taller tufts and I've done that in just a few select spots all around this area. So now I'm going to do the same thing again, but instead we'll use the beige blend to represent some sort of dead grass and I'll be doing that more focused over in the sidings and making sure it's just in a few select areas and I'm going to pick some different areas to the bits I've just done with the greener stuff. So we get a varied look as we look around this whole section of the layout. Okay, so that's some of the more straw coloured grass added with particular focus over in the sidings. Got quite close to the pictures I've been looking at in terms of the grass cover. It doesn't seem to get much more overgrown than that. So the next thing to do is to start adding some more details, uh, bits of rail, sleepers and things like that, bits of junk. And then I'll finish things off with a few small uh, shrubs and bushes in a couple of small areas. You can see how the yellow stuff sort of sticks out a little bit more. So I've deliberately put it in little clumps here and there. But uh, in a few places it is mixed in with some of the greens as well, just to give a varied sort of appearance. And there hopefully you can get a better view of the sort of patches of grass that I've added to the sidings themselves. Not too much, but just a few either sides of the track and a couple down the centre. Not much traffic in there and most of it would be very, very low speed. So plants, grasses and things are really going to have no trouble at all springing up in that area. So I'm going to start adding a couple of details in the waste ground area. I've prepared some sleepers to put at the sides of the track, mostly concrete ones, as you quite often see those even today, stacked at the side of the rails, sometimes even just one or two on their own, just sort of dropped off to the side. I've also got some wooden sleepers, those are just salvaged from the Pico bullhead track that I use, and I'm going to glue those down to act as some bearers for resting a load of scrap rail on. The rail is Pico Code 75 and I've saved it from the station area when I originally tore that section up about two or three months ago. I sprayed those rails with some grey primer and then airbrushed them with the Humbrol Rust Wash. Quite a nice colour, not too orangey, just the right sort of shade for some steel that's been left sitting idle out in the elements. Some time has passed and as you can see I've assembled some scale model scenery cable troughing. Turns out I did have a packet of this all along, I've just forgotten where I put it. So you can see that I've, uh, I've built that and set it in to the surrounding hard standing and uh, you can't really tell that I added it later. I always like using this stuff because you can dislodge the lids and it comes with the cable detail inside. So I've deliberately loosened a couple of the lids on this side just to add a bit of interest to the scene. 
I'm going to add a small amount of grass to the edge of the cable troughing now that's all completed just to show a little bit of nature taking over again and then once I've done that I've got a number of small scenic details and accessories that I've prepared off camera and we can come back and glue some of those into position. So I've added a few bits of rail and those sleepers which you saw previously and now it's time to add additional details and bits of scrap and stuff lying around in this area. So I've primed and painted a few bits already. These are some scale model scenery palettes, they're 3D printed and they look quite effective once you trim off the excess bits of flash and stuff. So I've painted some of those up as you would commonly see old palettes lying around in areas like this. We've then got some Pico Bullhead buffer stops to go in the two head shunts at either end of the yard, just to give closure to that section. And then a couple of 3D printed bits from West Hill Wagon Works in the form of some traditional steel bins and some plastic uh, containers. These containers come sort of like a bright blue sort of color. And certainly when I've used them in the trade, they're usually a sort of uh, clear looking color. But by the time you've used them a few times, they tend to go this sort of horrible beige, sort of opaque colour. So I've painted those weird sort of beige colour and then just added a few washes and stuff to tone them down. The blue might be more appropriate for a modern scene but as this is set over 30 years ago you probably would have just had the yellowy clear plastic. So I'll add a few of those bits in and around this area just to make things look a little bit more interesting and uh, I have also taken the time to very slightly weather the cable troughing. It looks very fresh and stands out, but that's the sort of effect I'm going for, sort of a, a slightly weathered concrete appearance rather than absolutely ruined. So uh, there you go, nice bit of contrast and you can see it matches the sort of colour of the weathered sleepers that are lying around here as well. So that's put a few small bushes and shrubs around the place. I've deliberately kept it relatively small and sparse for the time being, but I might add to it again in future. In real life there are examples of very heavy, uh, sort of overgrown stuff, especially sort of more modern era around disused sidings and things like that. And there's also lots of examples of very sparse growth with just sort of short grass being the main thing. So I'm going to stay like this for the time being, but I might add to it in future. Heavy growth or sparse growth, as I've done now, uh, perfectly justified in the real world. There are many examples of both. 
I've also added a few small details. You can see there's a bit of machinery under a blue tarpaulin on the left hand side. And I've also added a small bit of railing just in front of the uh, stores sort of uh, shack. Uh, just to, you know, a little bit of a, a nod to some attempt at health and safety. The railing is a laser cut kit from Scale Model Scenery and I've just painted it in Vallejo black brown and glued it into place with some PVA glue. Next, to give it a little bit more of an 80s gritty feel, I'm going to add some litter as per what I've done on numerous other places on the layout. And for this, I'm going to be using the Scale Model Scenery litter sheet. I personally like to use the newspapers and the crisp packets that come on this, but there are also a number of other details that you can use, such as the shopping bags and things like that. I like to cut the litter out, place it into a small container and then soak each piece individually in some watered down white glue and then place it on the scene and that will allow you to uh, screw it up and make it conform to the shape of the terrain otherwise just placing it straight down as it is it's going to be too rigid the uh, paper on it needs to be soaked in glue so it properly conforms to the terrain as a piece of litter would in real life. So I've applied quite a lot of litter in just random places. And you can see how it sticks out at the moment, but it'll blend in a little better as the white glue dries. When you soak it in the glue, it becomes very pliable because the paper sugs right through. And then you can get rid of the rather crisp three dimensional shapes. And you can see in this case, I've screwed up the shopping bag a little bit. So it looks like it's been blown around by the wind. And the same goes for the rest of it, just using the tweezers to screw up the paper slightly to get rid of that uh, very flat rectangular shape and conform it to some of the details and, you know, tear it up a little bit. I've been working on some details for the points. Here you can see we've got some of the Pico dummy point motors. So these look a little bit like the sort of real point motor that you'd see out in the real world. They're not 100% accurate, but they're good enough for me. I've primed those and then painted them a sort of pale gray color to sort of mimic how they look in real life. And I've just gone over the top of those uh, with a little bit of oil paint, just to give a bit of a sort of dirty uh, brown wash to the appearance of them. So they look as though they've been installed for a number of years. So those will be going on the points that are attached to these main lines that will be run off of a signal box or signaling center further up the line. In the yard itself, it's very unlikely that the points in there are gonna be controlled by point motors and a signal box or signaling center. What you would most likely have is manual point levers, which you can see here. I've just knocked these up and uh, we'll put those on the points. Something else you might see is a ground frame, which is a framework with a series of points which is attached to it. And then by means of point rodding, running to the various points in the yard, a worker can control numerous points from one location. As this yard is quite small, it's only got three tracks. I didn't think we really need a ground frame, so I've just gone for the, uh, the single operation of each point with a manual switch. So that'll be quite a nice contrast looking out onto this scene. You'll have the old style manually actuated points and then you've got the remote motorized versions as well. 
I've just made these myself using a couple of bits of laser board which I've glued to a thin piece of plastic card to act as a sort of base and then the uh, the points the point rod itself is actually just a uh, small piece of brass wire that I bent with a pair of pliers glued it all together with super glue primed it and then painted it the appropriate colors it's not based on a real prototype it's just using inspiration from various different designs that I've seen around the place and I've just sort of combined those into something of my own making and there you can see one of them installed. I've dug up a little bit of the ballast and placed some scrap uh, sleepers from a bit of spare Pico bullhead track to extend the sleepers on the point out to the side so that I can glue the little platform with the lever on it in the correct position. They are a little bit further away from the point than I would like, but that's due to you know, the curvature and making sure nothing hits the, the delicate levers as they go around the point and the curve. There you can see where the sleepers extend out and I've just glued the platform on top there. I'll paint this uh, with a little bit of sleeper grime just to blend it back in, touching any ballast that needs doing. And I'll also add a little bit of uh, pretend detail that goes uh, down the middle of those two sleepers from the point lever so it looks like there's actually uh, a mechanism in there to uh, operate the points. Okay, well that brings an end to the video. Hopefully you enjoyed that. I certainly enjoyed putting all of this together. I do enjoy doing all of the weathering and little scenic details. This is by no means finished. It's still a work in progress, quite a lot left to do, including quite a bit of retaining wall detail in the background to frame this area in and make it uh, sort of look like it's all on one big raised area. So I'm gonna leave this area for a bit now and move on to something else. The station area is crying out for some detail, similar to what I've done here. And there's also a lot of uh, small little jobs and rough edges all over the place to make sure that all of the new baseboards are properly integrated back into the scenery on the lower section of the layout. So there's plenty to do, and this is now looking quite respectable. While it's not finished, there's uh, more pressing matters on other sections of the layout. So as always, I'll be back as soon as I've made enough progress on the next bit, and I'll leave you with a couple of running shots of trains moving around this new section.